um, with our speaker, uh, Miguel Coelho. And let me just introduce him briefly. Um, he is a, Miguel, you're a third year PhD student in our program here, right? Yes. Uh, at the University of Arizona in art and visual culture education. Uh, and he's been a professional since 2004. And he works uh, or has been working on several, several research projects um, out of a similar data set um, on visual essays um, in urban, urban landscape photography. His work was featured at the Venice Biennale in 2008. And he has an intense passion for teaching and tutoring. And besides doing work such as portfolio reviews, uh, and being a speaker at photography events, Miguel has over 12 years of international teaching experience at all levels. So welcome everyone. And Miguel, I will turn the conversation over to you. Thank you, Gloria. Um, so this presentation, and, and it, it, it's really funny uh, because we're here, the four of us, and we all uh, somehow know at least partially this work because I also shared this with on Ellen's class and that is on Ellen's class. So this presentation is based on a project I did um, in an art space research course uh, with you, Gloria, um, last semester uh, in my ABC PhD program and where I basically try to explore the connections and intersections between my art practice and my teaching or the way I teach. Um, so my background uh, always combined my art practice with my role as photography um, instructor. Uh, so I started teaching um, very soon or briefly after I started working as a professional photographer. And I've always been interested in curriculum design strategies uh, that explore the impact of art making processes on the author, artist, but also how these practices can effectively, effectively affect us as individuals and in multiple dimensions. So there, I always had lots of questions, uh, like how can I transfer processes from my art practice to the classroom? Um, how can students incorporate their, these processes in their work, or if it makes sense or not? Uh, what are the tools and skills they need um, to look at these processes and be able to use them? Um, as an art student and before uh, photography, I studied design and I studied architecture. Uh, I've always seen the work of art as a natural end product of a more or less structured process. Um, every process can affect, inform, and influence the products. And, and a very good example is um, the use of digital technologies, for example, in architectural or design uh, that enable us to, to um, achieve these impossible structures that were impossible 20 years ago in architecture or um, the appearance of multimedia, multimedia uh, objects. Um, but process is also um, and always very personal. Um, and I always give the example of architecture. In the architecture, the final design appears uh, at the end of a relatively long um, iterative research process uh, that combines sketches, uh, models, computer simulations, but is also um, shaped by building codes and norms, by the client's desires, dreams, and expectations, but also by the dialogue with other disciplines like building, construction, engineering. And so this, and, and this process doesn't just happen at the studio's desk. Um, it, it is a process that is thought and sketched in multiple um, media uh, at any time, um, conversations with other people, uh, restaurant tables. Um, and so the architecture uh, as a praxis, uh, which has as a goal, uh, or as an ultimate goal, uh, and almost always to design and build for others, um, becomes a very personal and intimate exercise um, of the architect's relationship with drawing. And by drawing here, I'm talking in a broad sense that includes models and simulations. But process is also sequential. For example, uh, photography, uh, limited by some constraints, both physical, chemical, and digital, uh, uh, sorry, limit, limited by constraints of physical, chemical, and digital processes, also requires a sequence of steps without which we cannot obtain any image. Um, the photographic act is always dependent on choices, 
uh, where to place the camera, where to look at, when to shoot, what I might photograph. And the subsequent post-production labor also reveal an iterative di dimension of photography, which always happens over a more or less long period of time in which the photographer struggles with his past, present, and future choices. This idea of why did I photograph this? Why am I looking at this that I photographed 10 years ago? Or when I'm photographing, would I be able to print this big enough for what I want to tell? Um, or what, what can I do now with this photograph from my archive? Um, so as a photographer, I've always been very interested in the relationship of time with photography and, and the author. Um, time defines and forms the photograph. So the moment we choose to press the shutter and the amount of time the, the camera, or the sensor, or the film is exposed to light uh, in the same way that it affects the conditions of reception of the image. It's not the same thing as looking at the image on the screen right now when it was taken in the 60s or today outside of the, its context. Um, but it also affects the relationship that the author has with his own work, where memory um, or other relations that can affect and can inform these new uh, relations. And the history of photography has plenty of examples of projects that took years to complete, of negatives that were lost and found decades later, of photographs that travel from the domestic ecosystem of family albums or from the ephemeral pages of a newspaper to gallery walls or museums or images that are revisited and rephotographed by other authors. In many years of teaching, uh, I've also observed that um, there was this gap between uh, the time needed for art and the time being used to teach art. Um, so curricula has been um, permeated by this unnatural need to complete everything too quickly, leaving no time to think, to reflect, or simply to be able to contemplate the images on the wall and return to them two weeks later with another look and to make more conscious choices. So I have this feeling that we stopped working with time and we started working with urgency uh, and divor divorcing ourselves from our work and our images, departing too quickly for the next assignment. For me, uh, teaching is very much about engaging the mind and developing new and critical thinking processes for which we need time. Um, but it's also about creating and strengthening the author relationship uh, with his work. And I believe it's exactly this strength and this solidity that blurs the boundaries between life and work that allows us to create and think critically about the processes and the product and that enhances the development of students' individual artistic identities. For this, uh, I believe we need to reevaluate the role of time. Um, time has the ability to affect the way we look at things. And one of the most, uh, or one of the best examples is when we think about someone that's close to us and we remember the first time we met that person, how it would seem different to us. So um, I've started, um, sorry. So I started designing a, a research project um, and um, again, as a photographer in my work, I'm less interested in the decisive moment, this idea of photography freezing time, freezing action, than I was in the effects of time on what I photograph. And the topics I usually photograph are this man altered uh, landscape or the organic growth of cities or ruins or the limits of cities, but also the effects of time on me as an author throughout the process. So in an attempt to examine this impact, um, it seems more to me more appropriate because of my emotional involvement with these topics to set aside these traditional subjects or these more traditional subjects and to try to focus my research on the process, on the procedural part of the um, art making because it's more apparently more generic and possibly of more universal application in the classroom. That's what I'm looking at. So I formulated a research that it's an art space, but also auto, auto ethnographic study that investigates the relevance of the processes in my artistic practice, but also how they affect the way I look at my subjects and the way I look at my work. So this investigation started by, an, by a very analytical look at my practice, the way I do things. And then by looking into how different processes can 
shape and affect the way I look at my subjects and the way I look at my work, this research is also potentially an active form of self-recreation, exploring ways of gaining access to new models of intellectuality and conscious about my, my own practice. Um, so, and this, this quotes come, come directly from my, from my uh, research project. Uh, and so the idea of uh, a research project that takes a full and ongoing account of the self, but also in the effect of the identity and presence of the researcher upon what's being investigated. And this research is informed by critical visual sociology, critical visual ethnography, but also cultural stu studies and interdisciplinary visual culture studies, and also studies of visual methodologies. So I've decided to create an experiment that allowed me to take a critical look at my practice. So we know that the devices we use in our art making practice can influence processes and workflows sometimes conditioning, sometimes expanding their possibilities and potential. So we know, for example, that when we have an audio recorder, we are looking for sounds. Uh, when we use a camera, we're looking for images. And when we use a video camera, we're looking to capture action. And so this project intends to examine other types of influences, how different work processes can affect and define the relationships we establish not only with our practice in a broad sense, but also with the artworks. Particularly, we will be looking at how three of the most usual processes, process approaches in photography impact our practice and the relationship we establish with its products. So um, in my experiment, uh, basically what I did uh, was to use um, one camera and one lens, uh, one roll of film, 36 exposures, and so using one roll of film to photograph one topic, one full topic. I was not allowed to mid-roll to photograph anything else, but the topic I, I previously selected, and I had to do that for those 36 exposures. So I define three different, so these three different processes um, are three, three different sequential stages. So the first, in the first stage, um, I would define the topic before living to, before starting to photograph. And I should be able to identify the locations using the map. So subjects should be easily identifiable on a map, big enough on a map, and being able to identify, and because they're on a map and I was using Google Maps on a satellite view, I should be able to identify them from the sky. So it, it should be something that I could identify. On stage two, I would select an, a topic also beforehand that I will drive or walk around looking for subjects while I'm photographing. So the subjects should be relatively ubiquitous to allow me to photograph one entire roll of film in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm in Tucson and I decide to, to photograph rocks on the beach, I will have a hard time photographing this in one morning. Stage on, on the last stage, um, probably the more complex, um, this is based or it starts. Um, so after I finish the previous stage, I would have five minutes to determine the next topic and then drive and walk around looking for subjects. So again, I would need to look for something that's abundant, but also uh, this means that on the last frame of stage two, I need to include uh, at least partially um, part of the first frame of stage three. And then I would have almost no time to decide what my subject would be, and then I'll photograph from there. So, um, and then I had my, my expectations before starting. And so knowing that my usual methods in, usually involves a relatively detailed plan, I was expecting to, this exercise to be more challenging to me at stage three, while I would, well, where I would have to make creative decisions intuitively and in a short time. While I don't expect a considerable difference on the aesthetic qualities of the pictures um, in the th three different stages, because I will be using the same equipment and the same technique, um, I was curious to understand how these different methods would affect me at the emotional level, particularly when dealing with time. This idea of making a decision uh, in no time, that's something I'm not used to, but also about physical fatigue. 
right? I would have to walk looking for something um, to finish a role, uh, to, fin to do 36 pictures, but also with my commitment and motivation. I cannot take a picture of something that's re really interesting to me while I'm mid-roll photographing something else. So the way of how I would um, stick to the topic and, and do it until the end was also, I was very curious to see how I, would I respond to that. But also I was curious to see how would I see and interpret those photographs or series at the end. Um, not, not by because of the artistic value that I was not expecting, but as a series, as a set of things that were done in this uh, almost um, forced way. And so uh, the format of this work was, um, I, I was never interested in the individual images at this point. So I decided to only look at the images as a set of images, so at the contact sheets. But also I decided to write something while I was photographing, um, sometimes at the end, sometimes while I was photographing. And so this is the only, um, I never sit to write after the work, after the research was completed. So this was kind of a journal entry while I was doing the work. And my expectation was that um, when looking at this at later, I would be able to extract from this um, almost instinctive um, entries um, all my conclusions and all my thoughts about uh, what I was feeling at that time. So again, on stage one, this idea of having something that was easily identifiable and located in a map, um, it should be also be part of a familiar set of photographic questions, the things I was used to deal with, and it, it had to be abundant. I, would, I had to be able to photograph. So when thinking about this and um, the idea of being something that was somehow photographically familiar to me, it was just to make it easier for me to start. And so I decided to, to look at strip malls. They were easily identifiable on a map. Um, I could, just by looking at Google Maps without zooming, I could find lots of them. So it would be a fairly easy process of doing this, this first stage. And so on this next slide, uh, what I do, and I can read these, these are direct quotes from my um, essay uh, or my journal entry while I was doing this work. And so I, I selected these quotes because somehow they reflect my um, emotional states and also my, my challenges and my, uh, my questions about my practice. So my photographic practice has got me used to planning and to looking at maps and thinking about the best time for a particular photograph. So I was, I was fairly comfortable with this or what I was working. Without thinking about it, this is probably the, the best part of this quote, uh, because I was clearly not thinking about it. I realized that at the end that all these images were photographed in the same way, horizontally, looking for the same type of angle and, composi uh, and composition. It never occurred to me that these places deserve more images or an extra effort. So this idea of having the red dots on a Google Maps, it, it made me a very, um, it was a very effective work. I would get there, I would park my car, leave the car, photograph, get back in the car and drive to the next location. Three days later, after looking at the contact sheet repeatedly, I realized that my lack of interest is not on the object itself, but in the photographs of the object. So I started thinking, what if instead of photographing strip malls like this, I photograph strip malls the way I usually do my work. I take a large format camera with a tripod and instead of photographing 36 in one morning, I photograph two in a weekend and I will be happy. Am I more or less intentionally refusing the idea that I was not able to make a good photo of a bad building? And so this was something, it was never a question. Uh, well, I, I'm interested in, in good buildings, but I'm also photographically attracted to bad buildings or to bad construction or bad architecture. Um, so this idea of uh, me not being able to do anything that I can see any value out of it was uh, kind of frustrating at this stage. So on stage two, I need to define a, a theme, um, but no, but I had no map or location. So it's this idea of going out and discovering things and with the uncertainty of what I would be uh, looking at. 
So um, I decided to select for this topic something that I would be able to photograph um, easily and something that I had some kind of interest um, and never photographed before. So this idea of curiosity also. So I decided to photograph um, American flags. Uh, I knew from the time I'm living in Tucson that is a very uh, easy, uh, abundant thing to photograph. Um, and I also wanted to know more. Um, and as Gloria probably remember, I was going through a, a very struggling time with my visa renewal. So I had all this, all these questions and personal issues with a, with a team of, um, with, with the American flag and the wood and how that topic is seen by lots of people. And so again, some direct quotes from my, um, from my, from my journal. Um, so I started this stage with a very clear idea. And, and again, um, this very clear idea was also my, my challenge with, uh, with my, my personal story, with my visa renewal. And uh, I was facing all that, all the uncertainty. Um, and so I had that, and I had the feeling that I'm going hunting. So I know what I'm looking for, the American flags. I have a vague idea of where I can find it because I, I, I drive through Tucson pretty much every day. So I see some flags here and there, but I don't know exactly where they are um, or I cannot tell exactly where they are. Um, each one of these 36 flags tells a, a different story. Um, I end up thinking not about the flags because they're all the same, different scales, but about each one uh, and each one of the people who raised them, I start thinking about who are these people? Um, why are, and how these flags are seen differently. Uh, why a flag uh, at the entrance of high school, for me is different than a flag that is um, between two thin blue line flags or an inverted American flag. Um, and I started trying to read more into that. And again, my visa renewal history was not helping at the time. And so the, the, the contact sheets confirmed my thoughts. Not only I, I, I did see the flags differently, but I tried to make each one tell a different story. And so the compositions are all different um, in some cases. Um, so I photograph everything from big flags to small flags on bumper stickers. So it is this um, trying to figure out how, how different all these things can be. And so on stage three, and um, so stage three starts on the last, with the last picture of stage two. So the picture in the bottom right corner. And so what I did, and I can show you. Um, so on, on the first picture in the top left corner here is I just turned 90 degrees from this picture here and I select one place to photograph. So I had to be able to identify a team um, and I have to decide is fast and I have to be committed to this. Um, and so I would, I would start photographing this topic without knowing exactly what I would found, find. Um, so I really had to commit. Even if on the second frame, I, I saw something that was more interesting, I could not go back, it started. So I, I made this first photograph because it, it, it seemed um, photographically interesting. Uh, but I had no exactly no idea what it was. So I, I defined it as potential spaces. So these spaces where something will happen, something happened in the past, this place that are holding for something and it can be um, a store during renovation, but it also can be an empty, a vacant lot um, in the middle of buildings. So I knew from the beginning that this would be the most difficult stage so the team was found, although, although I did not know exactly how to describe it. Um, while photographing, I feel comfortable. More than just hunting, I'm looking for images that help me to tell a story. So I defined the topic on the first picture and then I was trying to find things that could fit that topic. Um, so th this method is definitely the most distant from what I'm used to do. Um, or for, from what I'm used to. But the photographs are very close to the aesthetics that I like the most because I have the freedom to make things fit that topic. So I have this question, has this exercise changed my practice or has my practice shaped my response to the prompt? 
And again, I, I didn't try to, to get um, conclusions from this. These were my instinctive um, entries on a journal. So, um, so this experiment validates the, the possibility of applying this method in other contexts to get other results. So I started thinking, if I can extend this um, to other participants, would the results be the same? Would I get more data? This data would give me more information. And also by combining the roles of researcher, but also research subject, because I'm continuously working um, myself, I can consciously understand the possibilities and challenges of this research work. And so I started thinking about um, different future research possibilities. And one is to expand this to other participants, gathering more data, and to expand this also to other processes. It doesn't need to be with photography. It can be with something else uh, and other constraints. What if it's not time? And what if it's a geographic location to do something? Um, or what if it's um, a topic that goes from one person to the other, and one person has to complete what the person did before? So I, I started looking at all these possibilities, but also at the idea of using these data and conclusions to try to design new curricula and apply it in the classroom. And it doesn't need to be uh, higher head, it can be K-12, it doesn't need to be photography, it can be coloring, it can be um, using other types and other um, models of art. Um, and this is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miguel. Um, I appreciated um, listening to this again and, and mm -hmm. also um, knowing how you've extended um, by entering into your data, mm -hmm. uh, you know, almost through different doors. I love the fact that you always bring your, um, uh, your teaching into the work that you care very much about not only the researcher, you know, mm -hmm. but how this extends into your classroom and how it might uh, also be in dialogue with your students. And um, I've, I've dropped a few things in the chat, but I also want to open it up to um, the folks who have joined us in the room uh, to share any comments or questions. I think we're reading, we're reading the prompts. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, feel free to take a moment. Um, I've shared, um, and what I often, um, so Miguel made reference to um, uh, sort of exploring um, some of this work in an arts-based uh, methods course that I taught this past spring. Uh, and I often encourage students to consider themselves within the research and um, how important it is not only within arts-based methods, um, because often science will, will, natural science or those who are more connected to natural sciences and, and are connected deeply to numbers and statistics, um, the question becomes how, how validity shows up in methods that are more qualitative, that dig deeper into um, the narratives that we find within these statistics. And so students often ask, well, you know, how do I validate this, this type of research? You know, and I push back against the notion of um, an objective reality, because anytime humans interact with data, um, they're, the question objectivity the question of objectivity needs to be needs to be questioned. And so we have to consider ourselves and how we impact what it is that we're examining and the questions that we come up with. And so a good way to think about that is to think with the notion of positionality. Mm -hmm. And those those um, quotes I shared often um, help support why we as researchers should consider our position within the research. And so when I saw these images initially, 
that Miguel had uh, photographed of the American flag, I knew um, part of the narrative uh, regarding citizen, citizenship status. And for me, it became very obvious why um, some of the photographs um, or, or, or some of the questions he was asking uh, of this symbol um, came up, but I wasn't sure that others were aware of, you know, why, why the American flag? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course the American flag had a very uh, strong meaning during the last election and, you know, there are people driving around in trucks with American flags out the window and on the beds of the trucks and everything. And it just, it had such a clear, I uh, just had a clear uh, tro, uh, pro-Trump, you know, message that it was even different. I mean, it, it changed again, you know, during the Trump era. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's really great, you know, to, uh, to have, so we've been talking about these, um, these issues in the collaborations uh, topics class. And um, uh, we read a, an article called Enlivenment um, by Andre Weber. And he talks about poetic objectivity mm. and poetic precision and makes a lot of really great points about how, um, you know, it is, it is a fallacy, you know, to think that anything can be objective because everything is filtered through the subject. Um, and um, that what Miguel, what I think you've done so well is, you know, you've sort of revealed in a very um, systematic way, you know, the, this your subjectivity in these things that we basically take for granted. You know, we're just like, oh yeah, let's, I'm a photographer, I like to shoot this or that or whatever, but to sort of parse it, you know, to kind of say, okay, well, this, this felt comfortable. I liked it when you said, you know, I like taking good, good photographs of bad buildings, but these were bad photographs of bad buildings. <laughs> and, you know, just to kind of like, um, to sort of say, okay, this, this is what I do without thinking about it. And that's a great thing for students to for any any artist to say okay this is what i'm doing without thinking about it now i'm going to step back and i'm going to think about it and and i'm going to make myself think about it by putting these criteria um on myself that i have to then sort of uh strain against mm -hmm. and then those reveal things that i didn't know that i hadn't noticed or, or couldn't pinpoint so I, I think that's great. I also am very interested, we were talking about this last, last time also, this idea of time. And the time is, I mean, the, you know, one of the, the things I love about, um, you know, about art and science and thinking about how the two research uh, ideas of knowledge and research um, interact is that there's so much that's really confounding to science but it's experienced and shared through art. So um, this idea that art occupies these gaps in scientific knowledge. And one of those big gaps is time, you know, because time is totally confounding to science. They can't, um, they can't understand it. The other thing is consciousness. You know, there's no location or description of consciousness, but consciousness is what we filter everything through. So all knowledge goes through a totally mysterious process, a process that's mysterious to science. But when you talked about replacing time with urgency, you know, I really, I really get that. And I and I see that how that's deadened, that's kind of deadened people to life is that is the rushing, the constant rushing around and this constant um, increasing expectation of what we can do so that everything becomes urgent, everything becomes like, click it off the list. And so I really like that about your, um, your project too. I mean, you've sort of set these time limits and then you've experienced like these different relationships to time and to making in those, in those time limits. But um, I think we as educators can change time in the, in the walls of our classrooms. 
you know, because we're, we're part of it when we keep putting more pressure on our students and we give them, you know, the thinking and reflecting time um, gets, um, I mean, well, first of all, I'll just stay on my soapbox for a minute, but you know, like uh, every faculty person thinks they're their only uh, teacher that each student has. Nobody thinks about the fact that they're in five classes and that everything they ask them to do you know, sort of squishes their time into these little tiny boxes. So um, I like to think about what, what is already on the mind of the student, like, and what are they already doing in these different places and how can that be um, uh, like strengthened and deepened in, in another class or in conversation. So I'm really, I'm really happy to be um, interacting you know, with with your work with Gloria and with the ideas in the two in the two classes. So, so just really quick. So, so this um, the beginning of this project and or most of what I'm doing now. Uh, it 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 came from my um, for the appreciation I have for the process in my practice, and how that appreciation. Um, change the way I look at my practice and how I feel that improved my practice and I see and so there's I have this question so if other people can have the same appreciation would that the way they relax their in practice also improves as it, it did with me so I, I'm, I'm really in love with the process all the time and so is that is this idea of the process and so this is one part and the other part that's I'm I'm so interested in, in this project and I've talked about this project in, in Alan's class too and I'm talking here and I'll be presenting it again on Monday is um, the and, and, and I said this before so it's no secret um, the class I had with Gloria last semester completely changed my view on the program and the idea of what I want to do in the program and even outside the program so this idea where I can combine the two areas of research my practice and even teaching it, it's it's so um i feel that i'm getting so much from all the, this combination that all the parts separately that I, I really want to try to expand this to other uh, applications mm -hmm. yeah and you know that's another thing about time pressure is that the idea of making a product quickly mm -hmm. and the process becomes um just a, a a, a rushed and a um, sort of frantic, just get it done for whatever, you know, for the show or for the assignment or whatever. And um, it is really the process that's transformative. And even if that's the, um, the important part of the, of the teaching, you know, mm -hmm. is the, the, pro the love of process. Yeah, and I and I think too um, what is um, what I'm finding really really beautiful about um, your progress across time. I mean, did you start the program in fall of 2019? Yes. Okay, and so I noticed um, even some of your references, like to cultural studies. So mm -hmm. how you're taking um, the knowledge across um across your work as you're asking different questions mm -hmm. um and so it's you know i hate to use the word exploit but you're using the full capacity of yeah. the data that you're collecting by asking a different question you know um, yeah and, and so for example when i was preparing this presentation and I, there's the image of the photo album with two pictures uh, that picture is from a, a project i did on my first semester also in your class um that when i was doing this project i haven't thought about but when i was preparing the presentation i was talking about time and about changing context and about i said it makes total sense and so that's how i said the last semester course on arts research arts based research completely was the thing that connected all the dots for me mm -hmm. um so I, I i was very lost now i'm very clear about what i want to do yeah it's nice when that happens isn't it yeah yeah it's amazing yeah, the aha moment. Go ahead, Ellen. Yeah, and I mean, you're making a kind of natural bridge between um, 
you know, like the whole edu the education of um, art faculty in the United States is basically you get an MFA, you make your own work, and then somehow magically you know how to teach other people, you know, to do what you do. But there's no, absolutely no preparation for teaching explicitly. And then AMV AVCE, you know, is sort of on the other side where there's a lot of preparation for teaching, but there's not the same level of making. Somehow it's the idea that if you get an MFA, you're gonna be at such a high level of making that you're gonna know how to teach somehow, or, you know, know how to, and it's great, Miguel, that you've taken classes with faculty from that side, and then you're doing the PhD on the other side because you have, you know, personally experienced those, you know, that that gap really, and those those differences in the way of thinking. So, in a sense, you've done a systematic. You're doing like a systematic exploration of being an artist and teaching art, which a lot of art professors never do. So I'm really, really glad you're doing this work. Which even um, sort of brings up a question that I like to ask um, about uh, impact. You know, who will your audience or audiences be? And it seems that you're able to speak to uh, multiple audiences. Um, much like Ellen um, mentioned, you know, sort of bridging those two worlds. Um, you know, it's so having the MFA um, and then doing the PhD in art and visual culture education sort of allows you to have insider status to both sides, mm -hmm. really, you know, mm -hmm. that you can sort of offer um, the critique of the ne necessity for pedagogical. Um, strategies as a person with a studio background, you know, entering into um, education, uh, which is a topic that is, is contested. I mean, I remember talking about it in my own um, doctoral program, you know, sort of wanting to um, open the space for the need for pedagogical strategy. Um, if you do have an MFA, you know, and you want to go into the realm of teaching. And I'm pretty sure all of us at, at the same story that we have um, as teacher, amazing artists, but they were terrible instructors. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's fairly common. Right. Mm -hmm. And how do you have that conversation productively without, you know, shutting down the conversation before it even yeah. begins? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I like I like the notion of you know you you providing some sort of structure to this whether it's through you know the visual um, and the theorizing. Mm -hmm. This is great. Are there any final comments, Miguel? Is there anything that you want to share that you haven't shared yet? Um, um, where are you going? What's what, sorry? Well, I was just saying, where is this going? You know, like what has anything new emerged for you? Um, so, so the idea right now, and I, I'm um, probably this is my last semester of coursework before it comes. Uh, I might, I don't know. I, I still don't know if I would do another class in methods or. Um, but so this is the direction I want to go. Um, I don't know if it's exactly this, but I like this again. This idea of creating a, a framework um, that not only combines practice and teaching, but also analyzes both and try to make them effective. And by effective, I don't mean effective as an, as an industrialistic uh, concept, but, but effective, making it um, productive and reaching more students and reaching more people and helping um, bring more awareness to, to the power of the process or to um, the experience of the process. Um, so that, that's what I, I want to look at. I love your drawings. Oh, the, those are not my drawings. They, these were not identified on this. So the first, oh. so actually they were both my, my professors in um, architecture school. They're both Pritzker Award winners. 
but uh -huh. they were both terrible teachers. Uh huh. <laughs> but really nice drawings. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah I was that. gonna I was gonna ask you if you're still drawing if those were drawings I do I, no but I draw all the time yeah I mm -hmm. do I I I think I so architecture school no so uh, it was six years of school 36 hours a week 12 hours of drawing wow. a week so it's very it was very uh, drawing based thing so I used drawing as as uh, thinking I was drawing to think yeah, when you said the intimate relationship with drawing, I thought of, about process, you know, because that's that engagement with the eye, the hand and the mind that is also kind of a mysterious yeah. way of, way of uh, a, you know, a process of learning and doing. Cool. And Miguel, have you talked about what you would like to do after you finish the program? I like to teach. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I really, really like. I like to teach. Um, and I like what I do is my practice, but uh, again, I, I, I love the process. Um, I, I, I think I love the process too much. And sometimes it's for me just about the process I, or to try new things or to experiment new things. But um, somehow I always have this, I always have this uh, idea of creating a framework, uh, trying to, systematize what I do and 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 think about it it's um yeah sometimes I don't care much about the the end product uh, as I do with the, with the process yeah well yeah. it sounds like um you would be a wonderful uh methodologist mm -hmm. uh, for any position that you take up are you interested in higher ed or yeah. Any, yeah. Um, yeah well all of this is exciting Thank and you. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank for you sharing. so much. For sure. Ellen, I'm glad you could join us. Drew, I'm glad you're joining us from wherever you are. And so, yeah, the, Drew is also in our collaborations class. Yes. Oh, hey. Uh -huh. Good to see your face. <laughs> There's a baby. There's a baby's head, I think, right there. No, this is a little chair. Oh, <laughs> look at it. <laughs> my, like my daughter was in here earlier. That's why I had the camera off. How cool. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you all could join us this morning. And yeah. thank you uh, again, Miguel, for sharing your thank work. You so much. Yeah, well, it was great to, to have Miguel have more time. You know, he's he's talked about this project in the class, but not in such a thorough way. So it was thank great. you. Yeah. And thank now you. it's recorded. So you'll be able to go back and, you know, um, if you need any, you know, reminders of how you were thinking about or how you're talking about your work. We will have it for you. Thank you so much. Yes, and in my class, Miguel is doing photographs of students in their studios. Mm -hmm. So interested in the framework you create there, Miguel, yeah. to emphasize the process. Of so, so, and in thirty seconds, I know we have time. So the idea started to say, okay, I'm gonna um, start. I, I like this idea of photographing. Um, something that gives us an idea about what that person is going through or it's so is this idea and then i, I started looking at artist statements how can a photograph replace an artist statement as an exercise not as a and then what was supposed to be um and i always saw it as a very um tableau style thing where everything has detail where the discarded paper on the floor is the same importance as uh, something that's on the wall um, but then I started, what if the artists have a, a word on the process? What, what if we want to stage something? Um, so that's this dialogue now. Between what's, uh, we'll see. I don't know exactly how it will unfold, but it will be fun. Cool. Exciting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all again. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Miguel. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye, y'all. Bye.